Welcome to our eight acre homestead in the foothills of Western North Carolina. We're Taylor and Michaela, and exactly one year ago, we embarked on an incredible journey. We moved ourselves, our three adventurous cats, and our trusty camper to this property. Today, we're gonna to take you through all the juicy details of what we've been up to on this once abandoned land. After a lot of brush clearing and scoping out our property over this last year, we've been able to determine that it indeed used to be a farm of some sort, and a landfill. But we'll get into that later. Let's talk about what we mean when we say abandoned. Even though the property has obviously been long neglected, we have a little sympathy for whoever lived here before us. It was an older couple, and when her husband passed, it seems everything was cleared out of the house and tossed immediately outside. Clothes, food, furniture, family photos, and all. We're hoping to bring this home back toward a happy future as its past seems to be filled with sadness and neglect. In September of 2022, we were in some intense, very stressful negotiations on the property. We knew it had issues, a lot of them, but we were willing to revive this patch of earth to turn it into the homestead of our dreams. After a lot of back and forth and some very long evenings in the truck, driving up from the campground we were living at in South Carolina to fix the glaring issues with the house that were necessary to pass our appraisal, with permission from the owner of course, we finally closed on this overgrown kudzu trash jungle at a Waffle House in South Carolina on October 11th, 2022. We knew the house needed a new roof first thing, and we knew that because of that fact, we were going to find mold when we started tearing into the walls. So the very first thing we did was start to assess the severity of the problems. How did we do that? Well, simply put, we tore out everything. And I mean everything. In November, Taylor's best friend drove down from Michigan to stay with us and help us put the new roof on as well as hang drywall for the walls and re-insulate our attic after removing the current, soggy, moldy ceilings. December brought some interesting twists. We'd gotten rid of all the mold in the house, but with the drastic fluctuations between day and nighttime temperatures, the camper developed some mold problems of its own, even with a very oversized dehumidifier running full force. We made the decision to prep our future bedroom in the house enough so we could move in. We cleaned it a lot, and said goodbye to a lot of spiders. We plopped our mattress on the floor, set up a little space heater, moved our clothes in, and called it a bedroom. Spending Christmas in our new home, no matter how disheveled it was, was the best gift we could ask for. We were a little chilly, but we were happy. In January, we made another long trek up to Michigan so we could retrieve the rest of our belongings from storage. It was so nice to finally have somewhere to sit again. After a major cold snap around Christmas, the 2023 winter season proved to be a very pleasant one. We spent a lot of our time in January outside, prepping our future one-third acre garden, and hoping we'd have it ready by planting time. We knew once summer came around, we wouldn't be able to tolerate as much outside time with the heat and humidity that were bound to show up around May or June. So we focused our efforts on clearing as much of the brushy, overgrown landscape as we could. At this point, we hadn't even seen most of our property up close due to the brambly nature of it. With the help of a walk-behind brush hog, our trusty chainsaw, and many hours of using the hand loppers, our property started to open up, and we could see the possibilities it held up close for the first time. Even though a lot of our property holds so much potential, there is a portion of it that is nothing but daunting. We keep referring to it as our landfill, and you might be wondering why. Well, frankly, we believe that at some point in the last 12 years, whoever owned the land began to use it as a way to make money. They did this by allowing people to dump their construction trash onto the property. This is the area on our land that has the biggest elevation change, so we think they were trying to fill in and level out this gorge. If you look closely when the kudzu is brown and crispy in the winter, you can even see the piles and piles of sorted construction waste. Countertops, fencing, plastics, blocks, and so much more. It's not something you can see during the summer when it's overrun with kudzu vines, even when you're walking right through it which is a difficult task in and of itself. This was a huge bummer to find, to say the very least. Winter around here is a rainy season, or rather, a muddy one. We're happy to have moved onto the land in the fall because it gave us an opportunity to observe the flow of water over winter when it wasn't an overgrown jungle of greenery. Like many of the properties in our immediate area, this property was terraced into berms and swales, a lot like drainage ditches. This was done in the post-Dust Bowl era to reduce erosion. 
This means our entire property is shaped sort of like a bowl, or maybe an amphitheater, with a major 30 plus foot drop down into a gorge with a creek at the lowest point. Our whole property sits below the road, and we soon realize that water is something we're likely always going to be battling here. We're working on ways to best accommodate the water and work with it, not against it. The acre or so of land where we've decided to place our orchard is at the low point of our usable property, or the property that isn't wooded or swallowed up by kudzu. We're hoping to rework the berms in this area a bit, as well as some other groundwork, so we can direct a bit of the massive amount of water that flows across our property down to a holding pond at the base of the orchard. We'll be placing the trees along the berms and planting guilds around them in hopes to create a little orchard oasis that caters to pollinators. We haven't planted any trees down here yet, but we've started our berry patch and have some elderberries growing too. We'll finish cleaning this space up over the winter and by spring we hope to have the funds to get some trees planted. Our orchard will also contain a variety of berry patches, some grape trellises, a deer fence along the wooded borders, native fruits at the edges like elderberries and pawpaws, as well as nut trees on the borders. Speaking of water, our basement leaks, like a lot. We originally thought we could solve the issue by fixing up the gutters, let's not get into that right now, and recreating the dirt at the front of our house. Turns out we were majorly wrong. We found this out shortly after regrading it when a huge storm hit and we basically had a creek running into our basement. We'll need to trench around the house, waterproof and install drainage tile, as well as tear out the entire carport and driveway and replace both of those. An expensive project for a little further down the line. Pretty much since January, my main focus has been our garden. We were starting from scratch. Well, less than scratch. When we got here, the grasses in our future garden were almost as tall as me. I quickly made a couple of no-till beds with the pitiful amount of tools we had at the time to get garlic in for the year before winter hit. But I spent the rest of the winter and spring mapping out, tilling, and amending the remainder of our 22 beds and patches. Our goals for the garden this year simply consisted of one main thing get it set up. But we truly got so much more than we hoped for. We decided to just go for it and plant things to our heart's content, since we had such a variety of seeds collected anyways. We figured we'd plant and see what happened, and focus on observations this first year. I was able to can a couple dozen quarts of tomato sauce, all of our salsa and pizza sauce for the year, potatoes, carrots, pickles, relish, hot sauce, and more, just from our own garden this year, which blows my mind. We even foraged buckets and buckets worth of wild blackberries from the still overgrown portions of our land. I spent a lot of the summer canning both these garden goodies and produce we got locally or from the salvage store. It all adds up and we've got shelves loaded to the brim to enjoy over the next year, and we're not even done canning yet. In June, we welcomed our very first farm animals to the homestead chicks, and ducklings. And unfortunately, we had to say goodbye to one of them way too soon. We'll never forget that first loss. It was a small one, but one that hurt our hearts greatly. These guys grew so quickly, and with only having nights and weekends to work on projects around here due to working full-time, as well as budget concerns and changes in careers, having lots of visitors and traveling for various events for friends and family, We've struggled all summer to get their coop and run finished. We're making progress towards it again after what seems like forever. By the time you see this video, we'll likely have the coop enclosed and we'll be working towards enclosing the run, which feels like a major deal to us. As if we didn't have enough going on this summer, we also decided after seven years of dating, we wanted to elope up in the mountains. So we spent the early summer planning an intimate little gathering, and on August 18th, we set our vows surrounded by just a few close friends and some beautiful mountain vistas. Somewhere during the hot, dry month of August, much of our garden succumbed to the bugs, primarily the squash bugs and the leaf-footed bugs. It turned into a wild, overgrown, jungle-like mess, but it was beautiful and productive at the same time. We've had a lot of little setbacks, some struggles with the cost of, well, everything at the moment, and timelines taking longer than we hoped, but those things kind of just come with the territory. Trying to get the basic infrastructure set up on the exterior for the garden and animals to run smoothly has nearly swallowed up all of our time this summer. So the interior projects of our house have fallen to the wayside, but we're hoping to pick those projects back up soon. I'll be starting to work on finishing the drywall again this month, and Taylor will soon be working on sistering some joists in our basement. Once those things are accomplished, we can move on to putting down a new floor. Well, 
a new subfloor at least. We'll make our way to a finished floor eventually. We can't wait to keep sharing our progress here on this patch of earth that we call home, even if it's in small baby steps, and we hope you'll stick around to watch our little farm grow in the future. Going through all of the accomplishments and progress we've made on this property over the past year, it might seem like we've really got our ducks in a row, like it's all gone really well. And for the most part, it has. That being said, we wanted to go through a few things that we might have done differently and some mistakes we've made. You guys had some questions for us and we're gonna answer some of them for you. First question is, what's the garden pest you hate the most and how will you tackle it next year? Our first garden pest was Ricky. Hardcore. <laughs> he destroyed everything this spring. Over the summer, it was definitely the squash bugs. We got no squash this year. They killed everything. The leaf-footed bugs devoured our tomatoes. And then I think for the fall garden, it was kind of the deer have eaten everything, which we didn't have any issues with them over the summer. So, all right. What is your biggest regret and biggest thing you're proud of from the last year? I don't think there's anything that I regret. Maybe not getting things done faster, but that's kind of out of our control. I guess most proud of like how much land we've cleared. So we have a vision for all the different areas of the property. We can actually see the property now, so yeah. it's nice to be able to figure out what we want to do with it. I would say my biggest regret is just not taking more pictures and I take lots of them. I wouldn't have known that in the past. So now I just need to take a thousand pictures a day because I like looking at before and afters of things. And I think the mo the thing that I'm most proud of this year is just how much food we grew and preserved. I ran out of shelves because we preserved so much food. It's a lot. So it was really cool. We weren't expecting that. Now that you've been there a full year, what's your favorite view on the homestead? My favorite view, I have two. The first one is from the top of our driveway. Looking down, you can see the garden and our house and the sunsets are always really pretty from up there. You can see down at the orchard and everything. And then kind of like the flip side of that, down in the orchard looking up, it's just all uphill and it looks massive and beautiful. That's Those are my two favorite for sure. I really like the little cleared spot kind of at the top of our property. I like looking down from there. Everything we change, you can kind of see from there too. I also really like standing the back end of the gorge at the bottom of the kudzu jungle, just kind of looking up at all of that and seeing all that space that maybe we'll use someday. <laughs> okay, reflecting on all you've done, do you feel you've done a lot or do you still feel daunted? Both. <laughs> I think if you look around, we, we have done a ton of work here, but there's a hundred times more to come. So <laughs> it's, uh, it's a little wild to think about being here a year and what we've gotten done and how that compares to what we still want to do. I feel like the list just keeps growing. I feel the same way, both. Honestly, the cost of things for me is what's daunting. Just life right now is so expensive, but we're really trying to get our systems streamlined and set up, get up and running. We're still in that initial phase, even though it's a year later, we want to kind of get ourselves up and running with the birds and get them, finish getting them all set up and then their final coop and everything and things should start running more smoothly and we can just move on. <laughs> How are the ducks? Are they messy and would you get them again? Uh, the answer is yes, they're very messy. However, we have them, we've had them so far in a billion different temporary situations. They're just a pain in the butt to deal with water-wise because of that. I think once we have them in their coop and they'll have their landscaping pond, yeah. they'll be a lot easier to deal with. And I, I love them. I think they're hilarious and really cute. I would get them again. But again, we're just in that phase of getting to the point where they're a little bit easier. They are really good on their own, too. I feel like the chickens, maybe I don't trust them as much, but I feel like they require more supervision. <laughs> Honestly, it's probably a, the amount of them. Yeah. Like, there's a lot. We have 16 chickens and there's five ducks. So. But the ducks will kind of just roam around all around yeah. the yard and the garden. And they just kind of do their own thing. And they always go back to their pool and find little bugs to snack on. I feel like they're a little less destructive to the garden and stuff. They'll yeah. just, they just kind of, they're really self-sufficient. You can let them into the garden. They won't destroy literally everything, just some things. Yeah. Um, the chickens, it, they tear things up, which is yeah. fine. The garden's on its own right now anyway. Yeah. It took the ducks quite a while before they really started eating plants. Yeah. 
I would get them again. Okay, what is your least favorite homestead chore, speaking of the ducks? I feel like we don't have a lot of homestead chores. We have a lot of normal life chores. Just keeping up with day-to-day -day tasks seems like a chore when you're trying to do so much other stuff. I guess if I had to pick something, I really don't like dragging around our 200 feet of hose to everywhere that needs water. <laughs> yeah. Um, mine is the duck water, the bird water. I have to fill up their water like four or five times a day right now. And that's completely on us. We're going to get them a better watering situation set up, but the temporary phase thing. So that's definitely my least favorite. How did you go about searching for a location to settle down? I've kind of talked about this quite a bit in other videos and stuff. If you watch our six month video, it's our entire story of how we got here. But we kind of always knew that we wanted to live in North Carolina. I've always wanted to live here. And we came here in 2017 together and we're like, Western North Carolina is where we want to be. So it was just kind of a lot of working towards getting ourselves here. Things had to fall in place, but we also made a lot of sacrifices to get here. It took a few tries to get here and it just eventually worked out because we wouldn't give up. <laughs> so, I mean, you just kind of have to decide where you feel best, where you want to be. Yeah, I mean, I would say knowing that we wanted to be in Western North Carolina, this area specifically was never an area we had been to before. We basically knew where I was going to work. And where he could work. Where I could work. <laughs> I knew how long I was willing to commute to work. And then we just started looking in that area, you know, and this yeah. was, what this, this area actually had multiple properties and houses that we could have, like houses we could afford with property. Yeah. And uh, it was, ended up being a pretty nice area. Too. Yeah. And this is the cheapest one we could find and it had the most land. So we got lucky with that. Are there any new projects you're starting soon? Yes. But the biggest project still is the coop. So it's a never ending coop. Um, it's, it's getting there. <laughs> I feel like over the next couple of weeks, it's really going to kind of start looking finished, even though there'll probably be a hundred little things to tidy up with it. So yeah, over winter, our plan is to kind of clean up the orchard some more. We went through it when we had the brush hog and kind of took down all the smaller stuff. I took down a few medium sized trees in there. There's still 10 to 20 in the orchard itself that need to come down. And then there's an old fence line on the edge of the forest. And we're going to kind of bring the trees back to that old fence line to widen it a little bit and uh, open up another usable berm. Yeah, and we're going to work on the trees along the yeah. kudzu field too. We just have trees everywhere. Yeah, yeah, it's just a lot of like really overgrown patches of trees that need to get thinned out. And over there, the kudzu has basically killed those trees completely. So they need to come down and yeah. that'll also help us kind of fight the kudzu back a little easier and we can uh, plant some trees there that we actually like and we'll take care of and make sure they don't get choked out. Yeah, honestly, that tree line, I'll show it to you guys, but on that tree line, it's kind of important that we have a tree line there because when storms roll in, they almost always come from that direction. The wind that whips past here is insane. The rain literally comes through this porch directly <laughs> sideways at you most of the time. This whole porch gets soaked. On the inside of the house, our projects coming up are, I'm going to start working on drywall again soon. Taylor is going to be sistering joists down in the basement and kind of jacking up the floor, the joists a yeah, little bit. Where the, the uh, fireplace hearth is, is a bunch of brick just laid onto the subfloor. So it's, it's sunk over time and it's kind of pulled down the floor underneath our load wall. Yeah. So we got to square that all back up. Yeah. So then after we do those things, we are going to put another layer of subfloor down because we removed the upper layer when we were demoing because it was just a soggy mess and moldy. It was three quarter inch MDF that had been absorbing water for the last 60 years, you know, since the house was built. So the plywood underneath, it's too thin to be the only subfloor. So we're just going to double layer that plywood, get it up to... A usable thickness and then we are going to kind of just go through all of our stuff downstairs and get rid of a bunch of stuff because we're sick of having to move it around and stack everything up and whatnot whenever the basement floods which is pretty often honestly <laughs> we want to go through all of it and then get it up on 
to boards or just something to keep it off the ground, but we need to have less of it to be able to do that. Over the winter and in this next month, we're gonna be planting garlic, shallots, and onions in the garden. We're also hoping to build at least one or two raised beds to get everything set up so we can grow carrots in the spring. In general, we want to be able to have a little bit more time for doing some of our hobbies at night over the winter because it's been so long since we've been able to work on anything besides homestead stuff, which we enjoy doing it. I want to work on my sewing skills a little bit. I have some things that I want to try out and Taylor got me a whittling set for my birthday and I haven't been able to test that out yet. So that's something I want to do just while we're sitting and watching TV after dinner. You want to work. He's got wood chop stuff that he wants to work on, guitar building and stuff like that. Um, I'm going to let you just answer this one because I think we have the same answer for it. Do you have any homestead purchases you regret? Again, not not really that I regret. Well, our first lawnmower, maybe. <laughs> I'm sure I could have waited a, another week and found a better one, but it's what was available when we needed one and what we could afford. That's kind of how a lot of our purchases have been. I mean, the the wood chipper that recently blew up again was... Really, I mean, it did a lot of good work yeah. and it wasn't a bad deal by any means. Yeah, it didn't last us a year. It's just kind of been but... like a when it rains, it pours situation. <laughs> yeah. We're just making do with what we can find and getting what we need when we need it. I don't really have any regrets. It's just been a series of get her done. Who taught you to can and preserve? So I taught myself just off of YouTube and then the ball canning and preserving. It's like the ball blue book, I think. I'm a visual learner, so I just follow the instructions in the book, but I watched YouTube videos to be able to see how it's supposed to look while you're doing it. And that's how I learned. And I've only, I canned two years ago for the first time. I did it like three times that year. And then I took a break for this whole last couple of years. And this year I've canned a ton of stuff. So I'm still a newbie to it. I don't know how to can things. <laughs> He'll learn eventually. All right, this one's a fun one. This one, literally the question box, this one was an Instagram question. It just said babies, question mark. <laughs> I'll let you answer that first. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, the idea is nice someday. <laughs> it's kind of hard to fathom with everything else we have going on. Yeah, I think my answer is that I would absolutely love to have a baby, but I need less jobs <laughs> right now. I have, I, I'm currently staying up until anywhere from 2 to 5 a.m. almost every night at the moment, just trying to keep up with everything we're doing and work and all that kind of stuff. So as much as I would love it, I can't even fathom the responsibility of having more things to do that have to be done. And also just financially, it's really not in the budget for us right now. <laughs> so that's, that's kind of where we're at on that. What's something you feel like other homesteaders on social media don't talk about? This one's a juicy one. <laughs> so it's kind of a sensitive topic and it's not something that I don't want to upset anybody, blame anybody. Our social media, and this is a social media platform, what we choose to put out here and what other people choose to put out is it needs to be what you're comfortable putting out into the world and sharing with people. And I think I personally am just more comfortable sharing things than probably a lot of people are. With that being said, in the homesteading world, I think that money gets talked about in a sense that it's discussed in very broad terms and you should be saving money, you should be paying off debts, you should be reducing your consumption and living a simpler life and stuff. But we want to always be transparent with you guys and we're probably never going to be able to be debt free or anything like that. We started this lifestyle at such a young age that we didn't even have time to work towards paying anything off or starting a savings or anything before we started this. We could have waited 10 years and worked on paying down our student loans, which even after 10 years, they wouldn't be paid down. We could have stayed in Metro Detroit and waited 10 years while working towards paying that stuff down before we started this. But our mortgage here is cheaper than it was in Detroit. And we are spending more money on projects and stuff. Again, we're in our startup phase of this. And hopefully after we get the chicken coop done and stuff like that, the house finished, 
we're not going to be blowing money constantly. Yeah. We've just, we're 27 and 28. We've never had the chance after school to save up money or anything. We're learning skills. We're where we want to be and we're doing what we want to be doing. I think that that's a good compromise, even though it's a sacrifice in the short term. It would probably be in different ways and it might be a little bit less. I personally think I would be just as stressed about money if we still lived in Detroit as we do, as I am now. I don't know. What are your thoughts on homestead people don't talk about? <laughs> The money is a huge one. It's just, you know, all the equipment that it takes to do this kind of stuff costs money. And Tools. from another, yeah, from another hobby of mine, I know that mechanical things break often. And when you have a lot of mechanical equipment, not only did you pay for that equipment, you have to pay to upkeep or replace it. Keeping all of it going takes a lot of money. And I think if you probably ask a traditional farmer, they would make that very clearly evident to you. And that's why, I mean, a lot of, if you do it professionally, I think, you know, people take advantage of grants and things like that, yeah. that, you know, maybe someday we'd look into, but it doesn't really fit our situation now. So it's kind of just a lot to get up and running. Like you said, hopefully that kind of, <laughs> over the next few years, hopefully yeah. that kind of smooths out and we're more of in a maintenance phase rather yeah. than a building phase. I feel like right now we've been incurring startup costs <clears throat> But since we've been trying to do that on a budget, the things that we're getting are used stuff. So we're also, we're in startup phase and maintenance phase because we're replacing things at the same time because they're breaking. So yeah. yeah, honestly, just money. It's very broadly talked about, but I think that detailed information on it isn't really given. Right. And I mean, it's different for different people's situations too. Yeah. We, we bought a property with a lot of wild overgrown trees if you didn't trash <laughs> i don't know maybe maybe if you bought an old farm or something that was mostly a field yeah you wouldn't need a big chainsaw you wouldn't need a wood chipper but or, but you might need more plowing equipment yeah. or something like that like it kind of just depends on your situation you could be buying a property that has outbuildings that are usable ours right. aren't you can't even walk in our outbuildings because it's you might it might fall on you right so i mean even if you bought somewhere that had decent shed you could make into a chicken coop yeah. That would be a, a huge starting point. And then any kind of, we have multiple animal shelters, but like you said, they're collapsing. So we're going to have to... Actively collapsing. Right. So it'll actually cost us money to get rid of those over time yeah. <laughs> rather than, you know, something we can use in the future. It's a very personal thing. And I know a lot of people probably aren't comfortable sharing with it, sharing that kind of stuff. But I think personally, like, us sharing those kind of details and that stuff in detail can only help other people. So... That's that's where I'm at on it. How much have you made on YouTube so far? Just to provide some context for you guys, we've been making videos since January of 2022. We got mon <laughs> we got monetized at the end of June this year, 2023. We hit our first $100 at the end of August this year, 2023, um, which is what you need to be able to get paid. You need to hit the $100 threshold. So in September, our six month recap video kind of blew up a little bit in small YouTube in small YouTuber terms. <laughs> and a bunch of you guys kind of decided to stick around and follow our channel, which is really cool. So as of right now, it's October 4th today, I think. Yep. Yeah, it's October 4th. <laughs> Where we're sitting at with what we've made in the, like the lifetime of our channel from the end of June until now, I just checked it earlier and we've made $671.65. And that's just, most of that's in the last month or so. We don't expect that to continue like consistently due to just the virality of that one video going off last month. It just boosted our views and our revenue a little bit. What new things do you guys want to grow next year? In the main garden, I think we're really going to focus on peppers. We did a couple, well... We did a few pepper beds this year, but they were kind of mixed in with some tomatoes. We tried varieties that we've never tried before and some that we really ended up liking, but I wouldn't say any of them ever really got, <clears throat> none of the plants really ever got as big as they should have. And they've, they've still been producing, which is nice. Yeah. I mean, we're um, not going to put tomatoes in the between them next year for sure. Yeah. So we'll focus more on kind of specializing those beds and focusing on more plants of the varieties we use. I know we definitely wanted to do a full, full bed of bell peppers. Yes. We use a lot of bell pepper. We'll probably do another one that's a fun bed of varieties of sweet peppers. I really want to try growing some of the elongated, like Jimmy Nardello sweet peppers. They're not necessarily 
really bell peppers, but they're sweet. Yeah. And then cubanelles, that's what they're called. Those are really good. And cachucha peppers. I really want to grow cachucha peppers. I've wanted to grow them the last two or three years and I can't ever find the seeds. Something that I really, really want to grow next year is saffron crocus. In general, I really want to focus more on herbs and perennials in our little cottage garden next year. We're going to simplify the main garden a little bit. This year, we just tossed all the seeds we had in and let it grow. Next year, we're going to specialize to what what we know we eat and grow more of each of those things. And then I want to focus on the cottage garden. And I think it would be also really fun to grow some food specifically for our birds, our chickens and our ducks, because they just, they love snacks and it's yeah. really fun to see them get excited over food. <laughs> so I want to grow stuff for them too. Something we've talked about growing, I'm going to let Taylor ta tell you about it because it's kind of his thing. It's a really cool future idea for sure. So it's kind of like a long-term thing. Fruit trees or nut trees would be. Um, but we're thinking about maybe growing tea, tea camellia. I found there's a somewhat local place that does tea growing co-op. They're like a tea producer. So if you grow plants from them, you'll always have a customer for your tea. And it would be cool to kind of have one... It wouldn't be like on a huge scale, but it'd be kind of cool to have one or two things that maybe put some money back into the property. Yeah, so we're not, we're not trying to be farmers. So. No, it definitely wouldn't be like a full-time thing. And I'm sure it probably wouldn't even pay that much, but it might cover our costs for planting the rest of the garden, you know? The camellias are perennial. So it would right. be really investing in the property. So yeah, we might get started just growing a handful of plants and kind of experimenting with where on the property they might fit well and if we can grow them well. Any hints at your three or five year plans or new long-term ideas you've had since getting things established? We can walk through some of these things. Our plans, I mean, I'm just going to say longer term plans because <laughs> I don't think anything has a timeline at yeah. this point. We're just doing whatever we can do next, whatever we can afford next. Just look, with that said, don't hold us to anything we say here. It might happen, it might not happen. The tea is one of our long-term plans. Long-term is a very uh, subjective term here. Right. <laughs> it, might, it might be next year or it might be two years from now. We want to get bees. That's one thing we really want to do down in our orchard for sure. We're not very sure on how many we want to do or how many we want to start with, but we want to take a beekeeping class that our local beekeeping club offers. I think the next big project we're going to do outside, I guess big as in a building project after the coop is done and hopefully we have our lives together a little bit more, <laughs> our streamlined setup. Next fall, we're hoping to start building our goat barn. And then if that goes well, then hopefully the next spring, so spring 2025, ish spring summer 2025 yeah. we're hoping to get some goats and we do want to get dairy goats um not like all dairy goats we just want to get a couple i think the goal is to eventually have three to five six max yeah yeah we don't want a ton but we want a number that can help us eat some kudzu some that we can get milk from eventually when we're ready that might not be an immediate thing just because i think getting used to the animals and caring for them will be our our yeah. primary goal just depending on what's um, available too so yeah, but building them a barn will kind of be a, a shared space too. It'll give us more shed space. Right now our shed is an old utility trailer that's just parked behind the house. It doesn't have wheels or anything anymore. It works and I'm happy it was here, <laughs> but it's pretty rough. It's definitely not watertight by any means. And there's definitely a, a mouse or two living in there. Uh, so having a new- Mouse? That's a cat sized rat. <laughs> Ricky is scared of that thing. Having a new space to store, well, for the chickens and future goats, you know, like hay storage, food, feed storage, lawnmower and equipment storage. It's not going to be huge, but it'll be one half of it'll be a good size shed and storage for that kind of stuff. And then the other half of the building would be for the goats. So <laughs> we still don't have a furnace or central AC or anything. We're going to just deal with the whole little heaters and the window units and stuff probably again for at least another year since we've gotten used to more temporary heating and cooling solutions i think that we're we're more comfortable using that in you know for the next year at least we've done it all this year and it's worked out just fine so we're kind of putting more thought into what we want to do with the furnace heating and cooling for the house we were always going to do a heat pump i was researching into it a little more and it's a little bit more expensive, but again, we can do a lot of this work ourselves. 
is we were thinking of doing a geothermal heat pump, which is cool. They're generally just more efficient and last longer than heat pumps. They use the basically the ground temperature as your coolant instead of air. They're just more efficient. They require a lot of tubing to be put in the ground. Still need to get some more exact measurements where that could go, but especially like our soil here is really wet, which is really good for heat transfer. We could also tie that into a new water heater. It can be used to basically eliminate the electricity use of your water heater. So that, that might be our new plan. In the meantime, we're also looking into getting fireplace up and running as a propane, it's like a propane insert, like a gas log. We're trying to figure that out in the next month or so. So we just, just in case the power goes out this winter, we don't have to freeze again because it happened a few times last year where the house got really cold really fast. Hoping to be able to use that if we need to over the winter as a backup for heating the house. Oh, something that's on our really long-term list that's definitely not going to happen in the next three to five years is we just we were talking about this recently so i figured i'd bring it up we want to do a bermed greenhouse and keep our citrus trees and stuff in there and things that it's too cold here to grow we originally had an idea where we wanted it to go but i think we're going to potentially move that to a new location we have a general idea of where we might move it to so i don't know are there any other long-term big skill I, I guess I mean a gra the garage. Yeah, a garage. <laughs> That'll be a pretty big scale thing. It's um, gonna be the biggest thing on our property. Yeah, it'll be really big. But everyone I know that has a barn has run out of space very quickly. So I'm gonna. That'll probably happen to us too. But we'll try and not make that mistake. It'll have to be a wood shop <clears throat> slash mechanics right. garage slash normal garage all in one. So. We, if we're going to build it, we're going to build it. We also have to put in a new driveway to be able to do that. Another driveway, not a new one. So yeah, uh, that's going to be a project yeah. later down the line. Once, once the house is done, we'll start looking at that. So I think that's all the big stuff that we're planning currently. Again, subject to change by tomorrow. Really, we're just kind of taking things slowly and as they come as we have the money and as they need to be done because there are a lot of things that we have plans that we want to do something and then something else comes up like this tree that's in front of that was in front of us that we took down stuff just has to get done sometimes and it's just like a taking it day by day thing that's all the questions as we conclude this video we want to express our heartfelt gratitude over the past year on our growing homestead we faced challenges like excess trash flooding and rising costs We've juggled full-time jobs, career changes, a little wedding, and more while sharing our journey with you all. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up and consider sharing it with others who might find inspiration in our journey. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel to stay connected. Your support means the world to us. Thank you for being a part of our little community here. We look forward to sharing more adventures with you in the future. Until then, take care, and we'll see you guys in the next one. Bye.